Hello, and welcome to the Crisis Point Podcast. I'm Eric Sammons, the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Here at Crisis Point, we are interviewing leading Catholics about different topics that affect the church, specifically the crisis in the church and in the culture. Uh, if you like this podcast, please subscribe wherever you might be listening to it on YouTube or Odyssey or whatever podcast feed you happen to use. Today, I am very excited because I have a good friend of mine, Dr. Peter Kwasinski. Just because we're good friends, I mean, I can pronounce his last name. Anyway, uh, he is the, he's a writer and speaker on Catholic tradition. He is a Thomistic theologian, a liturgical scholar, and a choral composer. He's a graduate of Thomas Aquinas College and the Catholic University of America. He's taught at Franciscan University's Austria program. He's also helped establish the Wyoming Catholic College. And I, he's the author of, is it 11 books? Is that right, Peter? That's right. 11 books, uh, which six of which are on Catholic tradition. A couple of my favorites, I have this one is uh, Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright, which is, uh, is this Angelico Press? So, yes, Angelico Press. This is excellent. Um, it's great. I guess somebody else in the family is reading it. You can tell from the bookmark. Um, so I, I highly recommend this. And also your most recent, I think it's your most recent book, is The Holy Bread of Eternal Life, which I admit I do not have, um, but I'm, I'm sure it is excellent. So those are two great, uh, great books to check out when you have a chance. So Peter, thank you so much for coming on board today. Yeah, thanks. Eric. So what we want to talk about today is the booming traditional Catholic movement. I think most people who pay attention to what's going on in the Catholic world know that traditionalism has really caught fire in the church. I, I know a lot of it's anecdotal because it's very difficult to quantify this scientifically already, but anecdotally, at least for me, parishes that celebrate the traditional Latin mass, celebrate the traditional sacraments, are just growing exponentially. I mean, I'm talking doubling every year or even more. And it specifically happened more recently in the past year or so. And so we want to just talk today about why that is happening. So before we do though, Peter, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, what kind of the history of traditional Catholicism in the church, what does that mean? And where have we been in the past? Yes, exactly. It's a fascinating history. Um, it's, it's yet to be written in, in a full form. There are different articles and books you can find, uh, and certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence if you tap the older generation. Uh, but basically what you can see is um, a slow but steady growth among Catholics who are attached to, who love the traditions of the church, love the traditional liturgy, um, from the time of 19, really the mid 1960s, even before Paul VI promulgated the new missile, um, the, you know, Bocce was founded, I think, in 1965 to preserve Latin and Gregorian chant, which were already very much under attack and being rejected at that time. Uh, then when in 69, the Novus Ordo Missae came out um, and, and Udoboche kind of shifted more towards just preserving the, the Tridentine rite, the traditional Latin rite, as it existed um, before that time. Um, and then you, you, know, you had kind of, I would say, like an underground existence for a while, especially throughout the 1970s. England was one of the only places in the world where there were scheduled, permitted, uh, Latin masses, um, but uh, you know they they kind of survived in the underground. In 1984, I would say was the first uh, pivotal moment because that's when John Paul II actually wrote a letter, a uh, quatuor albin anus, um, in which he said to bishops, you know, you should permit for those groups that that request that you should permit uh, the the classical Rome rite. Um, it was kind of, you know, it was printed under an indult, so it was seen as a permission, and a lot of bishops were really hesitant to give the permission. So again, that was only a moderate boost uh, here and there, basically if you had a favorable prelate. Um, 1988, with the consecration of the four bishops uh, uh, by Archbishop Lefebvre, um, that led to Ecclesia Dei, so that was an even stronger letter from John Paul II, encouraging even more that bishops should finally open up and just, you know, do some pastoral outreach to these poor, downtrodden, tradition-loving Catholics. You know, these this motley minority. You know, um, but again, that you know, I, I would say that fell on mostly deaf ears. Um, nevertheless, you know, it wasn't going away, and there were gradually more and more. If you look at maps, uh, you know, you, there are more and more pinpricks on the map of places where the, the Latin Mass was being offered in you know, after 1988. 
the huge jump, the huge breakthrough was, was really in 2007 with uh, Benedict XVI's apostolic letter, Motu Proprio, uh, Summorum Pontificum. Um, I think almost everybody's heard of that. I mean, if you basically have any interest in the liturgy, you've heard, you've heard of Summorum Pontificum. Uh, that was the letter where he said, he said two very remarkable things, actually quite a few, but two in particular. Uh, the first is that he said the, the, the old Roman liturgy, the pre concilia liturgy, was never abrogated. It was never legally abrogated. So it, it, and it was therefore in principle always permissible. That's what he said. You know, and a lot of traditionalists were rejoicing and a lot of other people were scratching their heads and saying, gee whiz, that, that's not how it looked for decades. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it, it, it sure looked like it had been suppressed and abrogated, <laughs> but he said that. And then secondly, he said, every priest of the Roman rite is free to celebrate either the new mass of Paul VI or the old mass, you know, in its version promulgated by John the 23rd in 1962. Every priest is free to do either one, no permission necessary. Well, of course, once that happened, there were lots and lots of priests out there who had been waiting, had been waiting for a sign from the church, from the highest authority. This is okay to go forward. You know, you have the green light now. And that was the green light. So that that was around the time when the Fraternity of St. Peter, the, the, the canons regular St. John Conscience, they couldn't keep up with the number of priests who wanted to be trained in celebrating uh, with the with the Trisomissal uh, of 19, its 1962 version. Um, and so there was, you know, in terms of the charts, there's this massive uptick in 2007. And then there's a kind of, it's the tapers off the growth, but it's still incremental from 2007 until I would say about, well, you know, you people could have different opinions on this. I think maybe 2018 or so, not for any kind of magical reason, but just it just seems like in the past couple of years, um, the, the traditional movement has finally gone mainstream and it, it's an option that's so much on the table i think social media has a lot to do with this but you know catholics everywhere who love our eucharistic lord and who are searching for reverence and searching for beautiful sacred music and so on they know that there is such a thing as the old latin mass and they know that they can find it in most dioceses uh, and sometimes there are multiple places that they can go to. Um, and so I think there's just been that, that growth in congregations that you were talking about from about 2018. And then COVID tied, uh, you know, 2020 just, just exploded. I mean, the, the number of people just, just skyrocketed at that point. Yeah. And so I want to talk a little bit about 2018 on in a minute, but so what was it like? I mean, I'm not sure how long, I mean, because I started going regularly traditional light mass 2011. So it was after the, the, the motu proprio. Um, and of course, I was familiar with Latin mass and I had, I was just a regular JP2 Catholic, conservative Catholic, whatever you want to call it. But I basically was, my attitude towards traditionalists in the 1990s, when I first became Catholic in the two, early 2000s, was very similar, was the stereotype uh, of mostly they're angry, bitter, or they're nostalgic, all those type of things. But what was it like for somebody in the 1990s who is, who's one of his big, you know, he's trying to live a traditional Catholic faith. And one of his big things is that he doesn't believe the traditional Latin mass could ever be abrogated. And then of course, later he's found to be right by a Pope, but kind of what was it like though for a traditional Catholic at that point? Sure, I mean, you know, I, I've done a lot of reading of, of newspaper articles, magazine articles, books from the 70s, 80s, 90s, just because I'm fascinated both by what the liberal, progressive, and mainstream people were saying, as well as by what the kind of haunted minority or hunted, hunted and haunted <laughs> minority was saying about, about their own experience, uh, what it was like. Um, it seems to me that there was the, the bitterness that is sometimes that was sometimes met with. I don't really think so much anymore. It's very much, I think, has evaporated now with wider acceptance. And with, but, but there was a, there could be a bitterness, and it was justified because they were so badly treated. For example, there were, there were situations where, you know, and this is before, way before COVID. You know, people, Catholics were forced to write down their name and address if you wanted to go to a mass. You couldn't bring any new people. It was only supposed to be for those who already knew about it. It was some, some bishops or priests would put regulations on like, only if you grew up with this, could you attend? Wow. You know, they didn't like to see children there. I mean, just, and you, these are the kind of stories that you hear about and you, and you think, my, my Lord, Ratzinger said, 
if this is the way the church acts towards what was once its holiest and most precious possession, then what does that say about the trust that we should put into, into the leaders of the church? They should at least have been able to admire and respect and venerate this great traditional liturgy, even if they said, well, for particular prudential reasons, we think it's better to do something else right now. But there should never have been this attitude of negativity and, and of rejection and almost a contempt for tradition. Um, and, and so I think that there was a real psychological and spiritual malaise and disease you know, within the hierarchy towards the traditional liturgy. And that's what, that's what the lay people and the religious and, and the lower clergy who wanted it were feeling and were, were sort of, that, that's what was um, you know, so painful to them, so hurtful to them. Um, I think what Benedict XVI did was, was just absolutely brilliant. It was such a move of charity and of, of pastoral wisdom he, he really thought, perhaps this is an impossible dream, but he really thought that if you just let everyone have their space, that eventually peace would result and people would sort of rebuild all the broken down bridges and there would start to be two-way traffic and all kinds of good things would happen. I think some of that has happened. I think what we've seen more as time goes on is that there are some irreconcilable differences and we don't really know how those are going to get worse worked out over time. That's and of course, when we talk about traditional Catholicism, why it's booming today, and we're talking about the foundations, you can't have a discussion about it without talking about Archbishop Lefebvre, of course, in the Society of St. Pius X. And that's the, that's the most controversial topic too, because even within traditional Catholic circles, there's a very different opinions about Archbishop Lefebvre and what he, you know, the consecration. Some people have a certain view of him, but then the consecration is something different. But we really should, though, how is the foundation that it seems, I would argue that he laid the foundation, whether you agree with everything he did or not. But how did that influence what Pope Benedict later did? Because, of course, Ratz, as Ratz, Cardinal Ratzinger, he was right there as the point man in, in, mm -hmm. In his in the 1980s with Lefebvre and negotiations and everything and of course it all fell apart and it, it ended terribly mm -hmm. so like how, where do we put him in, in the society in the in the in the scheme yes. of how we got to where we are today uh, it's yeah it's a very complicated set of questions but <laughs> this much you this much we can say for sure um you can only understand the drama of Archbishop Lefebvre and of the entire traditional movement if you understand the tensions built into ultramontanism, into this phenomenon of, uh, well, at least for some people, I would argue, I would argue this myself, excessive papal adulation, excessive attachment to every opinion and every decision of, of a pope, even those that are not given in a, in a sort of ex cathedra authoritative manner. Um, but, you know, Lefebvre himself grew up in a church that was utterly ultramontanist. You know, the pope was was in charge of everything in the church and his word was law, you know, and he's like almost like an oracle, like a divine oracle, you know, and you can definitely get this in, in this, it, you get the sense when you study the pontificate of Pius XII. Pius XII was like put on this pedestal and even the photography and the videography of Pius XII was so over the top, okay? So, you know, like he had descended from heaven kind of a thing. So this, this is the way Lefebvre was formed and suddenly along comes a pope, at least this is how he saw it, Paul VI, who disbands and dismantles centuries of things that earlier popes loved and cherished and defended and protected. So suddenly there's this huge cognitive dissonance, right? The pope now is, is acting contrary to the way popes have always acted before. He's not perturbing the deposit, well, particularly the, the deposit of faith as expressed in the liturgy. I'm not making claims about dogma in itself, the morals, right? He's the pope of humanity Vitae as well, of course. Um, so Lefebvre, you know, I think the expectation was that every bishop in the world would just simply roll over and take the liturgical reform in all of its radicalness and just say, okay, this is what the Pope wants, this is what we're doing. And that is what the vast majority of them did. But Lefebvre said, he said, no, I'm not doing this. I'm not, I'm not using this new liturgy, which, which is not what I was ordained to celebrate. It's, to it's very different. It's even, it seems to me to conflict with what I was ordained to celebrate and what the church has been doing for centuries and centuries. Um, and so, you know, you, you just have this massive kind of no, I'm not doing it. And, it. and it was connected with a no to various other trends in the church, the trend of ecumenism, the trend of interreligious dialogue, 
um, the trend of feminism. I mean, there were just a lot of trends in the 1960s and 70s that Lefebvre was effectively saying, no, this is dangerous, this is unhealthy, this is not Catholic. Um, and, you know, obviously Paul, you know, imagine has led to this whole faithful situation. Christian community, you know, hundreds of priests and religious and millions of faithful around the world, almost, you know, all over the globe, right? They are still in this imperfect communion with the church. They're, they're, they're not ex-Catholics. They're not non-Catholics. They're clearly Catholics, that, and the Vatican treats them as such. Um, and yet there's a, there's a wound there. There's some kind of wound that still needs to be healed. The fact of the matter is that that's at least his, his deep discomfort and alarm about the liturgy of the Church of Reform has been indicated to some extent by the fact that Paul VI himself started to permit the Latin Mass to be celebrated again. I, I mean, I shouldn't just say the Latin Mass, but I mean the old Latin Mass, right? Um, and, and John Paul II even more permitted that. He, he convened a group of cardinals uh, who told him, you know, the old Missal was never properly juridically abrogated, you know, and then Benedict XVI came out with this two more pontificum. And, you know, and even Pope Francis, whatever difficulties we have with him, has not reversed any of this, any of these decisions. The point being that wrong, why has there been this kind of like very modest, kind of almost embarrassed admission on, on certain points that maybe he had, <laughs> that, that maybe, you know, maybe he was right to say no about about the new liturgy, and it was okay that people wanted to hold on to the old liturgy, right? So that's, there, I see a kind of posthumous partial vindication of Lefebvre, even within the magisterium, um, which I admit mistakes, right? Yeah, and I think also, I think for traditional Catholics today who see more, or, or, I mean, just traditional Catholics, all Catholics who see the problematic nature of some of the things coming out of the Vatican, out of Pope Francis, I think that also makes him sympathetic to the fact that when Lefebvre was going against the Vatican, he that doesn't necessarily mean he's going against the faith, which I think many Catholics under like JP2, conservative Catholics like myself, under JP2 Benedict was like, if you go against the Vatican, you're going against the faith. Yeah. And now yeah. that we see that, well, perhaps that's not an equivalent thing. <laughs> Yeah. maybe it's not always the same thing no, no it's, it's like yeah you see it uh, you have a little more sympathy for lefebvre exactly. position at that point and it is especially not the same thing when you know thomas pink um who i'm sure you know about a yeah. uh, really brilliant professor at the university of london i believe it is um he's he, he he wrote this extremely important article that can be found on the josias website uh that taught it's it's called crisis in the theology of baptism, and what what Thomas Pink does in this in this essay is he shows that that in addition to magisterial determinations, which always happen in the history of the church from time to time, there's a CDF decree or bull or papal you know, apostolic letter or whatever. Apart from these official determinations, there is a whole realm that he calls official theology, but in the sense of non-binding, non-magisterial, but just in the air, what everybody's saying, what all the bishops and clergy are preaching, that kind of theology, which has no real inherent authority. It's just, it's just the dominant kind right. of intellectual picture and trend of the time. And he gives many examples of where that can be wrong. That is what like the fashionable things to preach about can lead people into some weird areas where the infallibility of the church is not at stake. And the inerrancy of the church is not at stake, or the indefectibility, rather, of the church is not at stake. Um, and so there can be this kind of dangerous uh, bifurcation or, or, or dissociation, let's say, between dogma and morals on the one hand, what, what we know for sure to be true from the councils and, and definitive decrees of popes, and then this realm of official theology, which is, you know, just sort of what the officials in the church happen to be saying, like what Cardinal Casper is saying or something, you know. Um, and, you know, he just points out that a lot of Catholics have a really hard time. I mean, if things were healthy, we shouldn't have to make a distinction between these two spheres. That is, official theology would simply match magisterial, you know, uh, teaching. But, you know, there can be times in the church where the what the officials are saying is, is, is either 
wrong or more likely is glossing over in silence all kinds of true things that the church used to teach and right used to hold or used to treasure right so when you study tradition as as i do that's kind of my, my living is to study um what the church has done and believed in the past you start to realize that there are these massive lacunae massive right, gaps yeah. right. in what the church today is talking about and not and you know and, and what she doesn't talk about uh and that's and like something even as simple as our love for our traditions our ecclesiastical traditions which have been confirmed and practiced by countless popes and bishops and saints many many saints um that idea that we should love our traditions is almost absent i mean i i, I never heard that growing up and you probably didn't either yeah. <laughs> And yet that was like, that used to be like a badge of Catholics. They were the ones who prized their traditions, you know? Right. So, yeah. so, okay. So we're talking about traditional Catholicism. It's interesting. We're 2021. So we are now, you know, almost 60 years from the beginning of Vatican II and the new 50 years out from the new mass. Now the new mass, the whole point of it was supposed to bring more people in, bring a, a springtime to the church. That wasn't the word used, that was later used by JP too. But it was supposed to be this reinvigorating thing in the church, giving new life so we could better adapt to the new world and reach out and things like that. And I'm I'm not one to really get into whether or not that was the actual motives of all the people who 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 were involved in it. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, that's what they said the motive was. And some people I think probably believe that. But obviously, it didn't work, and now there's this movement to just go back to where we we started, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? That the, why do you think a new mass wasn't able to accomplish what it was at least <laughs> supposed to set out to do? Yes, yeah. So I mean, that's a huge question. But yeah. I, I, I wrote one of my books. Answer that in thirty seconds. <laughs> one of my books, Noble Beauty, Transcend Holiness, is mostly about is, is mostly about that very question. Perfect. Why did it fail? And what does the tradition have within itself? What resources does it have to reach modern men better, right? Um, but basically, it seems to me that um, the church, you know, was trying to, as as it was said, read the signs of the times in the '60s. But there's a lot of evidence that that the church, or at least church men acting on behalf of the church, misread the signs of the times. Um, there was a huge collapse coming after the Second Vatican Council that most people couldn't even dream was about to happen. And 1968 is a year that particularly stands out. Just a huge rebellion against all of the remnants of Christian civilization and Christian culture. And it was a time for the church actually to, to sort of batten down the hatches and to say, and to double down on all the goods that we have that modern man is about to throw out, is about to blow up, thinking that he's gonna finally liberate himself in some kind of Nietzschean you know, paradise. Uh, or Marxist paradise. And then, and then when, when modern man comes limping back like the prodigal son saying, I was an idiot, you know, I, I'm just eating husks from swine and, you know, please give me the treasures that you saved, that you preserved. The church can say, ah, oh, yes, we preserved all these for you. You know, but that's not what happened. The church yeah. is like, I want to catch up with all you Marxists and Freudians and, you know, and like, we, we want to speak to you in your own language. And, and since modern people like sound bites, we're going to make the liturgy into sound bites. And, you know, and because modern rationalism, you know, ha seems to have won the day, well, then we're going to make our liturgy very verbal, rational, intellectual, you know, it's going to appeal to like middle class literate people, you know, which is what most, so they had this extremely reductionistic picture of what modern man was and what he needed, um, very utilitarian, very pragmatic, very horizontal, um, you know, almost socialist in a way, or democratic, you could say, uh, and, and that that was precisely to miss the point that the church is most effective in her message when she gives a message that's other than the one that the world gives. When she gives the message that's from our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, as St. Paul says, the man from heaven, uh, that is not, not the man from earth, not the first Adam, but the second Adam, the one who has something fundamentally new to tell us. And that fundamental newness, paradoxically, is what comes out in something like the, the beauty of the church's liturgy and something like Gregorian chant, however ancient it is, it strikes us as strange and as otherworldly and as, as you know, a message from beyond, right? You might say. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's not this sort of lame, half-baked, second-rate imitation of what's going on in pop culture, right? We all know, you know, that the music in church, in most churches, 
is embarrassingly bad. Yeah. It can't appeal. It only appeals to the boomer generation that grew up with it and that didn't leave the church. So almost everybody left the church, but the ones who stayed, they, they have a nostalgia for this stuff. And for young people now, it's like, get me out of here. This is horrible. This is like nails on a chalkboard, you know? Um, but, but you bring young people to a solemn high mass with incense and with beautiful vestments and with processions and with glory and chant. And, and it's like, okay, either they're going to run away screaming and say, this is like, like a vampire, you know, from, <clears throat> from the sign of the cross or something, a crucifix, uh, or, or they're going to be entranced and fascinated by it. And that's the phenomenon we're seeing, right? With the, 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 the youth who are being attracted to traditional religion. And what's interesting about what you're saying is that, as you know, a lot of the debate, especially online, ends up being these silly discussions of like, oh, you think the Novus Ordo is invalid or something like that. And, or as long as it's valid, then Jesus is there and that's all that matters. But I like, because what you were talking about there, none of it speaks of validity. None of it speaks of the fact that Jesus isn't at the new mass. What it's saying though is, is that all these additional features around which ones are best to direct people to Jesus, that they can see him more clearly. And we see the, with the big drop in the, the belief in the real presence, that's a perfect example of where the accoutrements, everything around it, surrounding this, this very, uh, like you said, middle-class, uh, middle-aged, uh, you know, literate population that they're directed towards, it just reduces it so much in the new mass. And so the debate about validity is just kind of, it's just beside the point. Yes. It, it's oh, more yeah, like exactly. else. Here's the problem. When, when you reduce, so the church has never in her whole history thought so reductively as to say the only thing that matters is that sacraments are valid, right? That's the, that's the bare minimum. That's like, that is the bottom line before the black hole where, where that's nothing like, happens. You know right. what that that's for like the, the, the field manual. Like if you're out in war yeah, and yeah. you need to say mass or, or hear a confession or do a baptism, right. here's yeah, the minimum you need to do. You yeah, like yeah. then you're thinking the minimum. But the way that the church has always thought and acted is, and it's and certainly the ideal that she's put forward, is to do the liturgy splendidly, majestically, solemnly, beautifully, movingly. Um, you know, and, and to do it for God, not just for our sakes. Obviously, it benefits us. He's, he's infinitely good. He doesn't need to, 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 to benefit anymore. But when the liturgy is directed to him in the sense that we give him the best we possibly can for his glory and for his honor, it then benefits all of us because it tells us we're taking God seriously and we're ordering ourselves to him with all that we've got, right? Um, so it, it's, you know, it, it seems to me that this is how I would put it. If you want to understand liturgy, you have to look at four things. You have to look at validity, which is whether it happens or not. That's like a binary switch. It's like, you know, the on-off switch. Then there's the question of licitness. Is it happening in accordance with all the applicable laws? So is it legal? Is it lawful? Is it being done lawfully? Then there's the question of fittingness, which is, does it have all of those qualities or traits that the worship of Almighty God ought to have, such as humility, adoration, reverence, right? We, we can imagine all kinds of qualities that are perfectly able not to be present, even at a valid mass, right? They can all be stripped away or even contradicted sacrilegiously, right? And then the final level is what I call authenticity. And authenticity is practice as it has developed organically over time. So if you want authentic liturgy, it needs to be the liturgy of the Church of Rome as it has been received and lovingly cherished and augmented and enriched over all the centuries. That's authentic liturgy. So what Catholics ought to be saying is not, they shouldn't be arguing about validity. They should, they should be saying, well, okay, granted, we all have a valid mass. What about, what about fittingness? What about authenticity? Are we getting the Roman right? Are we doing all that we can for God's glory and for our sanctification? Right, those are the questions right. that need to ask. So let's go back now to, to, to today and the fact that it's growing. Now, I've argued a few, in a few places that I really feel like, you know, obviously 2007 was a big watershed, but I feel like 2018 was. And I do think it's related to the McCarrick scandal mm, and yes. the fact that it, it we, because in 2002, the abuse scandal erupts and we feel like, okay, Eventually, we feel like, well, I think we've got that relatively under control in the sense that, you know, there's these processes in place. And 
we're not expecting new flare ups and it's in the past of like that. Then all of a sudden 2018 happens and we find that one of the high, literally one of the highest ranking people in the, in the entire global church. I mean, he is at one point McCarrick was probably top 10 in the world as far as influence and status in the church that he's a monster, basically. Uh, no, no question about it, he's a monster. And not only was he a monster, but people knew he was a monster. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the Pope himself, possibly, a couple popes, not just, not just Francis, but possibly John Paul II, I know there's debatable points here, at least suspected him of some terrible things. And yet he continued. Mm-hmm. And I know, I like the way one priest told me, he, he actually... Soon after McCarrick, he switched to the Latin mass at one of his, at the main parish uh, mass on Sunday. And he said, I feel like after the McCarrick scandal, we need to bring out the spiritual big guns. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. how he put it. And I feel like a lot of Catholics were like, I know, I mean, I'd already been going for years before this, but I, I, I admit there was a, a, like a switch flipped in me of like, we got to stop playing games mm-hmm. and being embarrassed to be yeah. traditional or whatever it's like yeah. we got to be for yeah. real and and go at this <laughs> yes I, I agree with that and i would add more and that is the the more people study the history of the liturgical reform the more they will find corrupt evil individuals involved in every step of it and i'm not just talking about bunini though he's right. infamous and he's the one who gets the most attention um and that's as it should be but uh, you know, Cardinal Bernardine, for example, is another one, you know, hugely involved in implementing the liturgical reform in this country, you know, pushing communion in the hand where it didn't exist before. And I mean, just on and on, you can multiply examples like this. And these men typically belong to the Lavender Mafia, you know, and when you, and when you do, when you connect the dots, the moral corruption and the liturgical degradation go hand in hand every step of the way. And I think a lot of Catholics, well, a lot of Catholics I know are aware of that now because the dots are being connected, you know, all, all over the place. But others have this kind of suspicion, which is maybe what you're talking about, right. that you know, maybe if the church is in meltdown right now, um, that, that that what happened to the liturgy has something to do with that. And and maybe if we're, or you know, at least there's some kind of causal connection, right? That, that there's like a mutual, there's a two-way street between you know, the summer of shame, 2018, the Carrick, all that stuff. And just the general new direction, adjournamento, you know, modernization, right. the new paradigm that Francis talks about, all this kind of stuff. Maybe, maybe these are all just, it seems logical that they would all be interrelated, right? Because they all seem to lead to bad things. And so at that point, attending the traditional liturgy, it's not as simplistic as a vote of no confidence, but it's kind of like saying, you know, why don't we pick up the thread where it was dropped, right? right. You know, it's after this point that people really dropped the ball big time. Um, I like what C.S. Lewis, I think, is the one who said, he said, if you discover that you've made a wrong turn, the fastest way forward is to go back. Right. Oh, yeah. Right? Amen. Um, well, that's, that's the truth, right? We're not going back for nostalgic reasons. We're going back for quite objective, important reasons, right? That have nothing to do with, you know, my memories of the past. I was born after the Novus Ordo came out, so I have no memories of the past. Uh, I, I, all I know is what I see now with my own eyes and what I hear with my own ears and what I experience. And that's enough for me to decide, you know, to make that permanent decision to go with the traditional liturgy. Yeah, and that, I've written about this a few times, what I call like the, just the church status quo, because I've worked in parish, I've worked in diocese, mm-hmm. and it's like the status quo in the church is 1975, that we're stuck in 1975, and you know how your typical parish is run, how the liturgy is celebrated, ev- the theology, the, the attitude, everything is just stuck there, and there seems to be this harsh reason, I mean, if anybody's a traditionalist, it's these status quo Catholics who are stuck right in one year, it seems like 1970s. And so I think a lot of people saw that that status quo, I mean, for lack of a better way of putting it, led to McCarrick, led to the summer shame, led to all these problems. And so it's like, like you said, why not just say, you know, let's just go back and start and like, almost like a, I don't want to, I was about to say the word reset, but I know the whole great reset, <laughs> you know, I don't want to like freak people out with that, but almost like you're hitting the, 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 the restart button and saying, okay, we, we decided in the 1960s, we're going to go in a radically different direction. It's not work after 50 years. I feel like we're, we've been, it's been long enough to realize 
it's not working. That doesn't mean, and this is something I, I argue with people all the time, is it doesn't mean every single thing that happened after Vatican II or in Vatican II is wrong or a bad development. Yes. It's just the overall project needs to be at least, at the very least, reevaluated and looked at and said, okay, where did we go wrong? And maybe even some places, where did we go right? Some things that we want to keep and, and stuff like that. And Yes. Yeah. No, I, 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 I mean, of course, no one has to say, you know, it's all been bad since a certain year. I mean, that would be almost right. superstitious. That, that would be impossible, right. given, given that human beings are a mix of good and bad uh, intentions and actions and so on. Um, but I think it's definitely possible to say there's a general line that was chosen. There was a line that everybody was supposed to be committed to. And it was a line of finally, after hundreds of years of the fortress mentality of the Tridentine church, right? The, 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 the anti-Protestant, you know, triumphalistic Tridentine church in Latin and with copes of silk and so on, you know, after all this, we're going to become open to the world and we're going to be a church of the poor and for the poor. And we're going, you know, blah, 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 all these, right, all these slogans, right? right. Which are put on felt banners, you know? Um, <laughs> You know, uh, as as it says in the book of Exodus, it was a dark a darkness so thick it could be felt. Sorry, <laughs> one of my worst puns. That's but, terrible. Uh, but you know, there are all these slogans out there, and those slogans have proven again and again that they are empty. And they're not just empty; they're actually pernicious. They're actually pernicious. What do I mean by that? Well, let me just take one example. Right, we have so many beautiful churches in this country of ours. Um, and most of them were built by the blood and sweat of poor immigrants who, who gave everything because they wanted to beautify the house of God as an offering to God and as a way of asking for his blessing. And so their, their, their life was put into these churches, right? And they loved going to beautiful churches because it's the free riches of the poor, right? That's what the, that's what the grand liturgy in a grand church is. And then in the 60s and 70s, people came in and they ripped out all this art. They whitewashed everything away. They took out stained glass. They destroyed choir lofts. They, they did everything they could to wreck this heritage, this inheritance. I'm sorry, but that's not a church of the poor for the poor, right? That's a church, that's a church of ideological perverts uh, who are acting for their own interests, of their own egotistical glorification. Um, and that's, and I'm sorry, but that's just where we're at. We have to see, we have to call a spade a spade and say, you know, it's time to say, this is over. This experiment has failed. You know, most Catholics don't believe in the real presence. Okay, this experiment has failed. We need to start over. Yeah. Now, why is it then, so we have the status quo doing this. Why is it that bishops seem so resistant to this? Even what I think a lot of Catholics would call, quote unquote, good bishops. And I, I think the most prominent example is uh, Bishop Robert Barron who recently wrote a piece and I commented on it at crisis about that really was pretty harsh against traditionalists. I mean, there's a little bit of trying to, you know, I think some people are saying, well, he's only talking about the rad trads or whatever like that, but it was a, it was a broad side. And I think most traditional Catholics took it as against them. Mm -hmm. Why is it that, I mean, you kind of know why somebody like the, the real radical liberal types would be against it, a, 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 you know, Cardinal Gregory or something like that. But why is it, it seems like so few bishops Mm -hmm. have i mean the the number should just say if you want to grow this is the way to go but so tell me are resistant to I, it there it's a, it's a i think there are a lot of reasons um one reason i mean just to get it out of the way because it's the most obvious one one reason is that a lot of these people are in cahoots with one another and they're kind of covering for one another and if they stepped out of line for a moment they would be just pummeled right they would be reduced to smithereens so i think there's there's a lot of groupthink you i mean it's Groupthink is is terrible uh, among the Episcopacy right now, um, and you can tell because there are bishops that you just know from one side or another that if they had freedom, if they felt they had freedom, they would step out and they would celebrate the traditional mass and they'd encourage seminarians to do it and so on. But they're just terrified of the ostracism that, and the marginalization that's going to come, and not and not unreasonably because they probably will get nailed if they do something right. like that. So that's the first thing. The, the second thing is. There really is, and I think I think Archbishop Vigano really put his finger on this. Whatever you think about his critique of Vatican II, I think that the fact that his critique of Vatican II, a lot of which seems to me to be really legitimate and, and at least uh, worth taking seriously, it triggered this instant sort of immune system like overload, you know, <laughs> overreaction, where where it really became clear that what he was saying, basically, he was saying, you all treat Vatican II like an idol 
like it like like some kind of ground zero like church history begins here everything has to be seen through this lens there's nothing else that matters as an interpretive framework and a filter for the whole history of the church and everything except vatican ii and the reaction to that actually proved it right, right. That is, that is, right. <laughs> it was like it was like when the when the muslims burned effigies of benedict the 16th for saying that they were too violent you right know? <laughs> like it, it was this kind of self-fulfilling you know behavior right. that, that they were doing um so I think there's really there really is this kind of ideological block, like an intellectual block, which is what what happens when you try to talk to a Marxist or you try to talk to a Freudian or something, and they're so convinced they see the world through their Marx colored glasses, and so for somebody who sees the world through Vatican II colored glasses and especially the liturgical reform colored glasses, uh, they can't imagine that the new mass isn't better for everybody all the time. They just can't imagine that. It's, it's right. because it's sort of excluded by the theory. The theory is that it's better for everybody and, and therefore it must be. Um, and, and the fact that, and then when you say, well, you know what, guess, guess what, Bishop Barron? You know, my parish, the average age is like 14 because there's so many babies in there right, right now. And, and, you know, all these young families are there, all these teenagers are there, people are getting married, baptisms are happening, all this stuff is happening. Every time the bishop visits for confirmations, he's just overjoyed because he never finds faith like this anywhere else. You know, guess that's the way it is. And then they just say, well, so, well you know, they have no explanation for it, right? They right. can't explain it because it just won't fit into their theory. Um, so I, I think that certainly that's, that's, that's a large part. The final thing I just want to say is lack of experience. Yes. If, if look, the people who, okay, it's not a fair fight. When traditional Catholics who are immersed in their rich liturgical heritage, when they criticize the Novus Ordo, I think that's valid because they usually grew up, I mean, they usually grew up with the Novus Ordo and then they experienced something different. And so they've actually got two, right. two things to compare. And they can, they can really, really compare these things. But most of the people who go to the Novus Ordo and are critical of the traditional mass, they don't know anything about it, or they've been once or twice. You know, maybe they've been once to a quiet low mass, they felt completely lost, and they said, oh, this is not for me, or something like that. So they don't get it. They haven't actually taken the time. You need time. I would say, I just I say to people, give it six months. You're, you're not really going to be able to form a good opinion of the old liturgy until you've been to, to it for at least six months. Right. And then you're going to find, surprisingly, that after six months, it's like the Pepsi Coke challenge or something, that after six months, when you go back to the Novus Ordo, for a lot of people, it's going to be a very jarring experience. Right. Yes. Yes. You know, and they'll suddenly realize, like, oh my goodness, I've really grown attached to this traditional liturgy in ways that I didn't even realize. You know, so I, I mean, with Bishop Barron, he, if he really wants to have an authoritative opinion on a traditionalism, he should start celebrating pontifical liturgies for the Fraternal of Saint Peter or something like that. And if he if he did that more often, he kind of got out, as you, I think you said, like if he got out in, <laughs> into the world of tradition and actually explored it, he might be impressed with what he sees. He might actually be intellectually converted. Right. And, and what what's amazing is, you know, it, you know, I know I know traditions have a bad rap, and some of it's justified, uh, a lot of it's not. But it, that's the thing is, if 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 some of these bishops, Bishop Barron or who, Bishop Strickland or or some of these other bishops. I think they would realize that if they embrace tradition, and I don't even mean necessarily they had to say, okay, everybody has to celebrate traditional Latin mass, but just simply they would celebrate the traditional Latin mass and be an example, maybe at the cathedral church, they would celebrate something like that. I think they would just be shocked by the support they got from the laity. You're absolutely right. They would be, they would not be uh, well-liked among in, in chanceries around the world and in the Vatican and, and all that, but they would get so much support from the laity. And I think there would be a, a true new springtime that could happen in their diocese. And so it's not like we, you know, we look at them as the enemy. We're looking at them as like, no, we want you here and, and you to realize this because we really think if you did this, then all you want for your diocese of a burgeoning, you know, vocations and, and young people and families, all these things that you say you want yeah. would actually happen. Yes. But you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to sound... I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but or, or cynical, but I actually I there's a part of me that wonders how many of them actually would want what you just described. That is to say, that is to say, I'm convinced that there are some bishops who are so committed to the Vatican II paradigm that they would rather close churches and shut down seminaries than and, and shutter the convents than have all of these places filled with traditionally minded people, right? Yeah. 
And that's, that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. But we have to look it in the eye and say, yep, that's there. There are people who actually hate tradition and hate traditionalists. <laughs> uh, and that, you know, so I, I, I hope, I hope, truly, I hope that there are many bishops out there who are just confused or ignorant or, or lacking in experience, um, you know, who are open-minded if they can just be, you know, if they can get maneuvered into the right position or something. I don't know. Right. But, so I hope that's the case. Yes, me too. Um, now, so we have so many new traditional Catholics coming on board. I mean, people who they might not even call themselves that, but they're basically now going to traditional Latin mass. They're they're learning about the traditional, and, and of course, it goes beyond just the traditional Latin mass. The whole traditional piety, uh, this, all the sacraments, all the devotions. But one of the great things is alongside of this, and probably be, and because of this. There's been a real blossoming of resources available now that was not available even when I started 10 years ago and definitely yes. not 20 years ago. Yes. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Let's talk, yes. let's talk about some okay. of those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're right. The, all the intellectual and cultural energy is with the traditional movement. Yes. Right now. Yeah. Like if you look at who are the good sacred music composers, they do exist. Uh, I know a whole bunch of them. They're all writing music in Latin for the Trinity Mass. I mean, they, they sometimes write music for other things too, but I'm just saying that's kind of their, that's their preferred, you know, right. mode is to work for the tradition because it's inspiring and it, 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 it inspires artists. Um, the architecture and sculpture, all this kind of stuff is happening again in a way that it, it basically had died for decades, right? And we have it coming back sort of, again, not exclusively within the realm of the, of the, the usus antiquior, the, you know, the extraordinary form, but, 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 because that's happening, it's kind of a tide, right? That's carrying uh, everything in its direction. Um, but I mean, there are a lot of publications now. If you want to get a hand missile, you want to get like a dynamite hand missile that has all the litanies, all the prayers, the whole liturgy in Latin and English, whatever. You've got multiple choices now. I mean, there are at least four of them in print, you know, and I've got all of them because I like to, I like this. <laughs> but, you know, they're all in print and it's easier to get them practically than to get a full missile for the Novus Ordo, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, and I mean, there are websites galore, like, I mean, you've probably heard of some of these things like Grego Base or Gregorio, the Gregorio Project with just thousands of Gregorian chants that have been newly engraved, newly typeset, and people can print them out. All these websites are printing out the ordinary of the mass, Kyrie, Gloria, Sanctus, Agnus Dei, you know, all the, the introit, communio, offertory, gradual tract, anything you want is online now. You know, you can even draw it up on an app and hear somebody singing it. You know, it's, it's all these resources are there. Why? It's because people are hungry. They're hungry. When they see it, they, these things happen because there's interest. That's why they're happening, right? That's how a free market right. works. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, there are all these, um, oh, I don't know, there's something called Divinum Officium online, where you can get the divine office in Latin, in, you know, any version uh, of the traditional divine office for any day of the year. So a lot of clergy use that when they're traveling or people traveling to work, back from work, they use Divinum Officium. There's something called latinmasswedding.com, which is all about how you can have your Latin mass wedding. It talks about low nuptial mass, high nuptial mass, solemn high nuptial mass, you know, photographs, resources, booklets, all that stuff, right? Is there um, sermonry.com is a website for priests primarily, although anybody can use it, that has classic patristic and, and other kinds of commentaries on the epistle and gospel for each, each week and major feast in the traditional calendar. I mean, I could go on and on and on, yeah. but this is... These resources are amazing. It's such a, there's such a renaissance right now, intellectually and culturally going on in the traditional world. And I'm telling you, there's almost nothing like that outside of it. Yeah, I mean, really, I, I, I like to liken back in the 80s and 90s, the energy in the kind of Orthodox Catholic world was with the charismatic movement. Mm. And that's where you saw a lot of uh, things being developed, things were growing and things like that. But that died out really in the 1990s and in the mm -hmm. 2000s. And now we see definitely the energy is, is with the traditional Catholic movement within the church. Uh, I mean, a couple of things I wanted to mention too was um, Sophia and Sue Press is putting out Benedictus, which right. is the Magnificat equivalent. A lot of Catholics know about the Magnificat, the, the little paper monthly missal that, that you, you bring to Mass with you. Well, now there's going to be a traditional Latin Mass one, and it, it's coming out in August, and, and it, it, it keeps you from having to flip. Because the number one question I get from when people start coming to the Latin Mass is, what missal should I use? And then their second question is, how the heck do I use it? Right. And, 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 and there are reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but and also you have like the 
the mother with her, you know, eight kids and one's like, she's holding one, she's pregnant and she's trying to look at a missile and she's flipping it. She can't even, you know, it's like, and her, the kid's pulling her veil and she's trying to, you know, so this is allow, no. you don't have to do a lot of flipping. So that's a great resource. Well, in fact, you, don't have to do any, you don't have to do any flipping, at least for Sundays. Yeah, right. So. Yeah, yeah, it just goes no, I, straight through. So that's beautiful. I think, I think Benedictus is an amazing resource. Um, I think that at least some of the listeners of this will have gotten their sample issues for March. Yes. You know, that's just a kind of teaser, like here's what it will look like, or here's right. a part of it. Um, but you know, I'm I'm very excited about that. I've already given several interviews on, on Benedictus and, and what a great resource that's yeah. Been. And I and I hear I already know that it is done very well as far as signups all uh, subscriptions already i mean just way beyond what they expected because i just think it's so many people and another project that you and i have both uh contributed to is Ma the mass of the ages documentary that cameron's oh, yes. doing cameron o'hearn's doing and that a lot of people heard that i mean that that was a perfect example they wanted to raise they did just a little bit of pre because i remember i was one of the people they interviewed before covid because i live close right. to them yeah and so it was easy for them they didn't have any money and then they do basically an ad, you know, they, they do some marketing and they, they do a fundraiser and they want to raise $70,000. They are raising $170,000. <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. And that to That's me shows the energy behind right. it because for those who don't know the Mass of the Ages documentary, it's basically pre present the traditional Latin mass in a way that any Catholic can, can appreciate and understand it. It's not, it's not meant to be, okay, we're better than you. Anything like that. It's not meant to be even like a, it's kind of like, here we are, you know, and right. here's, what we, yeah. and here's, here's what we who have we to are. share with you. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And it's done. I mean, oh, highest quality mm -hmm. of video work and, and all of that. And, and so production values. So and I believe they're hoping that's going to come out by the end of 2021. I think that's, yeah, hope. that that's certainly um, their hope. They, they came and interviewed me in my home uh, a couple of weeks ago. That's great. And, you know, Seven. lots of people have been involved in that. So these are type of things. And I think the Massey Ages documentary hopefully will bring even more people. Yes. Um, so, I mean, well, if you want... One thing, one thing that's going to be really necessary and very soon is for bishops, at least the bishops who are not completely closed off to, to this traditional renaissance, um, uh, they're going to need to start creating more parishes for the Latin Mass and more more dedicated churches for it because the churches, many churches I know of, are literally overflowing. They can't hold the number of people, and this and often happens that that because say the Fraternity of Saint Peter or the Institute of Christ the King, they don't have a lot of money typically, so they they just they buy whatever church they can find that is suitable for the traditional liturgy, but it's often quite small, and then they quickly outgrow it. So then they need a, they need a bigger place. So. I guess it's a good problem to have. I mean, we're, the traditional movement is the only movement in the church that needs to open more parishes rather than close right. parishes. And that's something right there to that. <laughs> and say, okay, if these people are opening parishes and, and everybody else is closing them, something, we got to pay attention to something here. Right. And if you're not ideologically just opposed to it, you should be open to that, that maybe we shouldn't move in this direction. And also that though tells the point that I know that, for example, uh, places do request like the fraternity to come and they just don't have the priest because they can't just accept everybody. They, they need to have standards of who they accept for vocations. And so some of these traditional orders, they're struggling to answer the call of everybody who's calling them, say, hey, can you establish yes. a, a mission here, or a parish here, whatever. And they can't, they don't have enough people at this point. Right. Yeah. Although it's, 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 it's not that those orders are not doing well. In fact, they're, they're, right. they're exploding with vocations too. Right. And the, I live 15 minutes from the Fraternity of St. Peter Seminary, and it's oh, just wow. packed. You know, yeah. they've got they they got 80 applications for last year, uh, for this coming year, and they'll take probably 20, 25 right. at the most. At the most, that's the most they can fit. Right. Um, uh, of the, you know, even if there were more who were qualified than that, so it's it's not for lack of vocations. It's actually just there are so many requests and right. there's so much need now. <laughs> uh, thanks be to God, right? This is a great problem to have. To be in a growth phase is a great problem for any any business, quote unquote. You know, and it is kind of funny because it it it, it the, the the most joyful place to be, in my opinion, right now in the Catholic Church is part of a traditional Catholic parish, mm -hmm. and it goes completely against the the stereotype that we're mm -hmm. a bunch of angry, bitter people. Because <laughs> so the fact is, so we see true. <laughs> yeah, we see the future, and the future is yeah. traditional. I mean, that's just it. Just is obvious that to those who are involved and. The prayer is, of course, that bishops will, um, and, and many priests will come on board with that as well, and more priests will begin to learn the Jewish Latin Mass and, and to offer it. Um, okay, well, I want to kind of wrap it up here. We're getting near the end. So where can people find out about the million and one things that you're, that you're doing, Peter? 
Uh, well, my website has at least um, indications of like it has <laughs> at my books and some of my articles, but it's it's not a dynamic website in the sense that it's not always updating itself with new right. things. And that's something I hope to to fix in the future. I definitely need something that's more dynamic. But still, you can go there and find out about me and about my books and about where I write. And you can contact me if you if you wish. Um, but otherwise, just find me find me online. You know, at the places I write, one through five, New Liturgical Movement, Bharata Chaley, Catholic Family News. You know, and Crisis. Uh, and, and LifeSite <laughs> News, of course, and Crisis too. That's great. Yeah. So, and I'll link to your website um, in the in the comments on, on for this uh, for this episode. Um, okay. Well, I think we're going to end it there. Thank you very much for coming on. And uh, for those of you who are Catholics who are interested in traditional Catholicism and maybe what's going on, where all this excitement is happening, check out Peter's website. Obviously, Crisis um, Magazine .com. We have uh, articles about it all the time as well. Um, but until next time, God bless you, Peter. God bless everybody. And talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.